Pekka Irvest's spiritual heritage. Matti Koskinen and Rano Rinkainen. Translated by Antti Savinainen, edited by Richard Smoley. Introduction. Pekka Irvest left a remarkable spiritual heritage in literary form, consisting of over a hundred publications, most of them lectures. Irvest's lectures on Christ and esoteric Christianity are central to the worldview of the Finnish Rosy Cross, an esoteric order he founded that continues to this day. His most important books in English are The Divine Seed and The Sermon on the Mount. Irvest authored several books which reveal deep occult perspectives on the nature of our existence. Some of them could be said to express the ideas of the secret doctrine by H.P. Blavatsky in a more concise and accessible form. The books discuss the evolution of the earth, humanity, and angelic beings over unimaginably long periods of time. Irvest also reveals the meaning of Jesus Christ and his work for the evolution of human beings. He distinguishes the cosmic Christ from the mystical Christ, the latter being the Christ in us. In addition to his literary works, other aspects of Irvest's spiritual heritage are found in the Finnish Rosy Cross. The three principal streams influencing this order are Rosicrucianism, Theosophy, and Esoteric Christianity. They converge in the inner school of the Rosy Cross, which will be discussed at the end of this article. The Rosicrucian Stream Rosicrucianism is a mystical movement that had its origins in the 15th century and became publicly known in Europe in the 17th century. The name of the movement refers to Christian Rosencruz, an enigmatic, and possibly allegorical, figure best known from the tract Fama Fraternitatis, first published in Germany around 1614. Rosicrucianism, viewed as a secret society possessing higher spiritual knowledge, is often regarded as the most important occult stream in the West. It has been influenced by the symbols of Christianity, alchemy, hermetism, Gnosticism, and the Kabbalah. Some have proposed that Freemasonry in its present-day form was founded by the Rosicrucian brothers to serve as an exoteric version of Rosicrucianism. Irvest wrote about the relationship between the Finnish Rosy Cross and Rosicrucianism as follows. Each society will take responsibility to what extent it represents the real, invisible Rosicrucian brothers. There is no privileged society, any society can be as true and original. The authentic and authoritative Rosicrucian society is the one that has a relationship and invisible connection to a Rosicrucian adept. This is the stance of our Finnish Rosy Cross. Let it show by its activities that one of the brothers stands behind it. The Theosophical Stream Irvest became a Theosophist in his youth. H.P.B., a co-founder of the Theosophical Society, stated, It is easy to become a Theosophist. Any person of average intellectual capacities and a leaning toward the metaphysical of pure, unselfish life who finds more joy in helping his neighbor than in receiving help himself, one who is every ready to sacrifice his own pleasures for the sake of other people and who loves truth, goodness, and wisdom for their own sake, not for the benefit they may confer, is a theosophist. Moreover, H.P.B. defined who is not a theosophist. He who does not practice altruism, he who is not prepared to share his last morsel with a weaker or poorer than himself, he who neglects to help his brother man, of whatever race, nation, or creed, whenever and wherever he meets suffering, and who turns a deaf ear to the cry of human misery, he who hears an innocent person slandered, whether a brother theosophist or not, and does not undertake his defense as he would undertake his own, is no theosophist. Teachings of Theosophy the foundation of life and existence is and always will be spiritual reality. The all-encompassing divinity unites the whole universe in oneness. Hence all people are brothers and sisters, regardless of any exterior differences. The human being is much more than the physical body. We have emotional and mental aspects, which are called subtle bodies in theosophy. Moreover, the innermost essence of all humans, the higher self, is immortal and divine. The ultimate purpose of life is to become aware of this divine essence. The human being is a reincarnating being whose higher self is repeatedly reborn on earth to evolve toward the great goal stated above. Life is a school as well as a path we must tread. There is a great law of cause and effect in nature, the law of karma. Everyone is responsible for their thoughts, words, and actions, whose consequences will occur in this or a future life. A purpose of the law of karma is to guide the human being forward, often using suffering and difficulties due to causes created in a past life or lives. A conception of the afterlife stages through which everyone must pass through between death and rebirth. There is no eternal hell or damnation, although the nature of afterlife conditions depends on the inner state of the person. 
Most people have two main stages in the afterlife. First, they live in a purgatory in the astral world in order to purify their lower nature. Second, they live in a heavenly state in their purified personality. This heavenly realm entails rest, happiness, and work in preparation for a new, better incarnation. The existence of the White Brotherhood, which is formed by people who have reached the full measure of the human being. They are called masters in theosophy. Some of them live on earth, and some reside in the invisible world. They are all engaged in selfless work for the spiritual evolution of humanity. A truth seeker should not blindly believe in anything, yet it is possible to become a sage who knows the secrets of nature. Theosophy teaches that different religions in their original form are like branches of the same tree, bringing forth different aspects of the ancient wisdom. The divine principle, which can be called the cosmic Christ, is behind all the great religions. All the great religions refer to this cosmic Christ, although using different notions and terms. Changes have occurred in religious and philosophical truth-seeking in the course of the development of humanity. According to Irvest, the greatest change was the so-called New Covenant, the work prepared by the teachers of the great religions and carried out by Jesus Christ. Hence Irvest teaches that we cannot understand the New Covenant before we have studied the older religions. He emphasized that no one can come to Christ unless they have sat at the feet of the Buddha, Zoroaster, and other wise teachers. The Wisdom of the Kalevala in the Light of Theosophy In the Finnish Rosy Cross, the Theosophical stream is supplemented by the Wisdom of the Kalevala, the great Finnish national epic compiled by Elias Lonrot and first published in 1835. Irvest presented his interpretation of the Kalevala and the key to the Kalevala in 1916. Irvest's explication is very important because without it, the Kalevala would probably not be understood as a spiritual text. The key to the Kalevala has opened rich vistas for many Rosicrucians and other open-minded researchers. In 1985, the 150th anniversary of the Kalevala's publication, Professor Matty Kusi wrote in the Finnish newspaper Usi Suomi, As a syncretic and ecumenical author, Pekka Irvest was ahead of his time, and probably he is ahead of our time as well. According to Irvest, the Kalevala depicts the path of spiritual knowledge in two stages. The first is the way of preparation, which is about purification, and the second is the way of acquiring knowledge. Moreover, the way of knowledge is described as the search for the sampo, a magical object, sometimes described as a kind of mill, that is a chief theme in the Kalevala. Irvest writes about the former, with the method of cleansing, a person tunes his corporeal vessel to the point that it can at least begin its purpose as a true path of development. The sages emphasize the cleansing of the mind as the first step in the truth seeker's path. That is why the Kalevala describes three tasks for the heroes Ilmarinen and Lemminkainen. In essence, they are both about cleansing the personality. Ilmarinen had to plow the field of adders, bridle the bear of Chuonla, and catch Chuonla as spike. Lemminkainen had to ski down the elk of Hesi, bridle Hesi's gelding, and shoot the swan of Chuonla. Ilmarinen had forged the sampo, which the Pojola's mistress had shut up within a stone hill. Only after Ilmarinen had forged the sampo was he allowed to marry the maid of Pojola. According to Irvest, Ilmarinen represents the forces of intellect that play a role in the evolution of humanity. Ilmarinen also depicts the wisdom and genius of all great helpers and initiates of humanity. The sampo represents the secret wisdom that is possessed by the sages of the White Brotherhood. There are different periods in the creation of the immortal body of the initiate. The Kalevala identifies four of these, the rowing of the boat, the playing of the cantel, a musical instrument, the taking of the sampo, and the final battle in which the sampo is shattered. The rowing of the boat teaches the lesson of psychism and mediumship. The playing of the cantel clarifies the distinction between right and wrong. The taking of the sampo indicates the distinction between good and evil sorcery, and the final battle marks the difference between human self-righteousness and divine sacrifice. In the final battle, the heroes lose the sampo, which is shattered. In this way, the Kalevala shows that the source of all wisdom and happiness is not only for initiates, but, as Vainamoinen realizes, belongs to everyone, like the fragments of the sampo. Irvest notes that the final battle is a drama about initiation which is referred to and anticipated in the Kalevala, will become true in the brightest, most miraculous events of another holy book. The Stream of Esoteric Christianity Esoteric Christianity forms the nucleus of Irvest's teachings, which focus on the Sermon on the Mount. These maxims are both esoteric and exoteric, secret and public. In Irvest's view, this is congruent with the present New Covenant, in which all knowledge is public. According to Irvest, the Sermon on the Mount is a standard and criterion of true Christianity. 
Irves devised his own translation and interpretation of the Sermon on the Mount, revealing to whom the doors of the kingdom are opened and what is waiting for us inside the kingdom. This is evident in the Beatitudes, which Irvest organized in pairs that differ from the order in the New Testament. Here is the New Testament order. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus' Five Commandments or Maxims According to Irvest's account, in the Sermon on the Mount Jesus gives his five commandments, which relate to learning a loving mindset, loving being, and loving acting. They take the following form. The first commandment, but I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. This can be expressed as, maintain peace of mind. The second commandment, anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. This can be expressed as, be pure in your thoughts. The third commandment, do not swear an oath at all. This can be concisely expressed as, be truthful. The fourth commandment, do not resist an evil person. This maxim can be cast in this form, draw your attention to good. The fifth commandment, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. In short, love all. These commandments are not meant to be followed one at a time, but all at once. Irvest interprets the first commandment as meaning we should learn how not to get angry and to control our emotions so that anger never blinds us and we do not become angry in our hearts. In order to learn to love, we must learn how to control our emotional life. Following the first commandment enables us to understand people and their mental life better. Indeed, according to Irvest, abstaining from anger develops the ability to sense other people's thoughts. In his second commandment, Jesus instructs us to be pure and not lustful in our thoughts, that is, we are to control our emotions in this regard as well. With real love, the emotional life is purified. Desires and passions cannot contaminate anyone who is a master of their emotions. Hervest states that learning to purify thoughts and emotions will teach us to see the auras, emotions, and astral lives of other people. In the third commandment, Jesus instructs us to hold our tongue. We must learn to live our lives without lies so that we always speak truthfully. According to Irvest, speaking the truth will permit us to see the abilities, tendencies, and characteristics that reside in other people, that is, the forces contained in their etheric bodies. In his fourth commandment, Jesus teaches us not to resist evil. Irvest regards this commandment as the foundation stone of Christianity. This commandment puts us in touch with evil, which has to be overcome by love. The more evolved our consciousness becomes, the more deeply we see and understand the relationship of evil to good. Jesus knew that evil cannot win in the long run. He also knew that it is possible to love evil so that it becomes good. According to Irvest, not resisting evil will awaken us to the memory of previous incarnations. Finally, in his fifth commandment, Jesus teaches us to love all people, not just family or friends. He instructs us to love our enemies and bless those who persecute us. In the Divine Seed, Irvest reveals the result of following this maxim. Extending love and doing good acts have profound psychic influences and consequences, allowing us to see God, the Heavenly Father, experiencing great love, which is behind everything and contains everything within itself. The Lord's Prayer According to Irvest, the Lord's Prayer is not an ordinary one. It is intended for people who try to follow the maxims provided in the Sermon on the Mount. When we pray, we usually talk to God, but meditation is more about listening to God. In this prayer, Jesus instructs us in the proper way to meditate. We are to do this in silence and solitude. It will give us a much better chance of keeping our resolutions. St. Paul and the New Reformation St. Paul has inspired Irvest in many ways. Irvest gave a lecture series on St. Paul and his congregations in early Christianity. These lectures have been published under the title St. Paul and His Christianity. Irvest recounts St. Paul's spiritual experience on the road to Damascus and the three degrees of believers in early Christianity, the Catechumens, the Pistoi, and the Teleoi. According to Irvest, the Catechumens and Pistoi are those who seek the truth. The Teleoi were truth-seekers who had had their own Damascus experience, direct contact with Christ. Furthermore, Irvest describes what a true Christian congregation would be like, only after the truth seeker realizes what following Jesus means and what the Christian life would be will they enter among the perfect. 
and if there were more of these people, they would form a true Christian congregation, which would follow Jesus. St. Paul is often regarded as a founder of the Christian Church, and his letters in the Bible have been used as an authoritative source for Christian views and dogmas. Hervest holds that, in many instances, St. Paul's teachings have been misunderstood. Hervest also reveals that St. Paul still follows and inspires the ongoing Reformation, which was left unfinished by Martin Luther. This new reformation is part of Irvest's spiritual heritage, which he left for the Finnish Rosy Cross to carry on. He discusses the theme of reformation in his final novel, The Great Adventure. The Inner School of the Finnish Rosy Cross The Inner School of the Finnish Rosy Cross, the Masonic Brotherhood, is an independent organization and is not part of any other Masonic society. This inner school is the most important spiritual heritage left by Irvest to his followers. He designed its guidelines and instructions and trained his closest disciples and co-workers to carry on this work. When Irvest was asked why he chose Freemasonry as the form of this inner work, he replied, At least you will have something when I'm no longer among you. Irvest was requested by his master to join Universal Co-Freemasonry, a form of the tradition that admits both men and women. Irvest noticed that the Freemasonry is indeed suitable for the work of the inner school and that actual Freemasonry is contained within the first three degrees, whereas the higher degrees are esoteric. Irvest also wrote and spoke about a Rosicrucian community college that would teach theosophical ideas. This did not come to fruition, but his inner school, which he also referred to as the Mystery School, has to some extent served the same purpose. Irvest stated that Masonic rituals are not important per se, instead, their efficacy depends on the seriousness of the spirit in the study lodges. This still holds true. Like classic Blue Lodge Freemasonry, our Masonic Brotherhood has been divided into the degrees of Entered Apprentice, Fellow Craft, and Master Mason. Each degree has its own curriculum, which Irvest described in his book The Lost Word. Going through these degrees takes about 10 years, but it is really a lifelong program. Perhaps it even continues for many lifetimes until the truth seeker achieves true initiation. The inner school does not guarantee progress, since that depends on the karma, dharma, and effort of each student. Of course, some people neglect their studies and attend Masonic Lodge meetings only occasionally. After some time, they will probably conclude that the inner school does not give them anything. But then all spiritual aspiration is based on free will, no one can be forced to seek the truth. In ancient times, a stricter order was followed, and it is still in use in some Eastern spiritual systems. The forms of seeking truth have changed with the admittedly slow spiritual evolution of humankind and different spiritual emanations. The Entered Apprentice degree concentrates on the great religions, reflecting the spiritual history of humankind. As already stated, one can only enter Christ through other religions. Indeed, Irva states that the apprentice cannot help but see the common thread in all great religions. The study text is Irvest's great religions as well as the holy books of the world such as the Vedas, the Tao Te Ching, the Avesta, the Papalva, the Egyptian Book of the Dead, the Dhammapada, the Edda, the Quran, and the Kalvala. According to Irvest, all great religions in their pristine beauty contain the great and solemn promise, the longing for God is not in vain as the path is open to God. The secret of knowledge lies within the moral battle of faith. The apprentice learns how to discern the real from the unreal and how to read holy books. An important text in this regard is Irvest Toward Light, which is also a good introduction to basic questions in theosophy. When the instructor observes that the apprentice has accumulated proper knowledge and attitude, the instructor requests that the apprentice continue the journey in Freemasonry. In practice, this means that the apprentice will take a written exam. Since we have no dogmas, the answers in the exam are acceptable when the apprentice answers them from their heart. In this next phase, one has to learn to know the mystical Christ and to learn to see how the mystical Christ has been the foundation on which the great religions have been founded. It is the tree from which all the religions are branches. It is the heavenly human being, the Savior, the Messiah to which all religions have referred. The apprentice has to learn to understand the spirit that unites religious phenomena, the reality behind spiritual experiences. By studying the New Testament, the apprentice will understand St. Paul's Damascus experience. Although of course it is not possible to command anyone to have spiritual experiences, the study program can prepare an individual for such experiences by enlightening and reviving the intellect, according to Irvest. In the second degree, the study program concentrates on sciences, arts, allegories, and symbols, as well as how the lodge symbolizes the human being and in what ways the human being is an image of God. This also involves learning how to give lectures on spiritual topics. 
The third degree is devoted to investigating the symbolism of initiation and the existence of the secret brotherhood. Irva states that the existence of the secret brotherhood is demanded by intellect, conscience, and heart. That is why the studies are partly historical, partly philosophical, and partly realistic symbolic. The Master Mason studies the history of initiation, in other words, the history of secret societies and brotherhoods in the Middle and Old Ages to the extent they have historical records. Naturally, Irvest's writings are valuable for this study. It is possible to take a final written exam in the third degree, which opens the door for administrative work and service as a guide to other Masons. Master Masons are responsible for sharing what they have learned with others and serving their lodge in various ways. At this point, if not earlier, it dawns on the Master Mason that one cannot receive unless one is prepared to give. But the real Masters of Wisdom give their knowledge only to the worthy, who want to pass on knowledge to others in one way or another and serve unconditionally.